Hello everyone and welcome to this video tutorial on necessity. Necessity is closely related to our previous topic of duress and particularly duress of circumstances. For that reason you should be prepared for the possibility of having an essay type question on exam 3 which asks you to evaluate the defences of duress and necessity together. And what we saw in our previous video tutorial on duress of circumstances is that because necessity as a defence is very limited, as we shall see today, um, that has led to the development of duress of circumstances. So they are closely linked, so do make sure that you know them both well and are able to write about them together. Today, though, we're going to be looking at necessity. The defence of necessity in criminal law is where the defendant is arguing that it was necessary for them to commit a crime. For example, where a prisoner escapes from a burning prison, he may raise the defence of necessity as it was necessary for him to escape. And the defence of necessity often operates where the defendant has two alternatives, either commit a crime or suffer or cause another extreme hardship. I want to make sure that I've stressed that the defence of necessity is very limited um, and it can only be pleaded in extreme circumstances and it's often unsuccessful. The courts are generally not prepared to accept it unless it's involving the medical profession, as we're going to see with the cases that we look at today. But the basic argument for necessity is that the defendant is trying to say that they're placed in a position where they believe they have to commit an offence or a crime in order to prevent a worse evil from happening. For a long time, it was questioned as to whether the defence of necessity even existed in English law. And it was raised in the infamous case of Dudley and Stevens, which we've looked at in previous topics when we've been looking at mens rea. If you recall the facts of this case, remember it is 1884, we had a yacht crew who were cast away in a storm and Dudley, Stevens, a man named Brooks and a teenager called Richard Parker managed to escape on a smaller lifeboat. They had no water and no food except some turnips which helped them through the first three days. On the fourth day they caught a turtle which they ate for a few days. And they had no fresh water um, and so Parker, the teenager, actually started drinking seawater. And this made him become very ill and very weak. After a number of days without food and water, the men were discussing what should be done if no help came and suggested that someone should be sacrificed in order to save the rest. Brooks disagreed um, and didn't want to take part. Dudley proposed to Stevens and Brooks that maybe they should draw straws to see who should be put to death. But Brooks refused to join in um, and the, the boy was not consulted at all. With no rescue in sight and Parker the boy getting weaker and weaker, Dudley said that the boy had better be killed so that they could all live. Stevens agreed to the act but Brooks still disagreed. Um, Parker was lying at the bottom of the boat, quite helpless, um, and Dudley, with the agreement of Stevens, went to the boy um, and killed him um, with a knife. And then all three men, Dudley, Stevens, and also Brooks, fed upon the body and the blood of the boy for a number of days. Four days later, by a stroke of luck, the boat was picked up by a passing ship and the remaining um, passengers, Dudley, Stevens and Brooks, were rescued, still alive but in a weak condition. And the three men were committed for trial at Exeter. Um, the reason it's Dudley and Stevens and not Dudley, Stevens and Brooks is that, if you remember, Brooks turned state's witness. So he was given immunity as long as he testified against Dudley and Stevens, which he did. Dudley and Stevens, our two defendants, um, were being prosecuted for murder because they'd killed Parker and they'd eaten him. And they were convicted of murder and their defence of necessity was not allowed. 
So the defence were arguing here that if the men had not killed and fed on the body of the boy, they would have died of famine themselves. And since the boy was in a much weaker condition anyway, he was likely to have died before them in any event. So that their act in killing him was to avoid a worse evil, if you like, better one dies and three live, than all four die. But you can see here that the court rejected this defence of necessity and they were convicted of murder. So the judges in this case found that there was no common law defence of necessity to a charge of murder, either on the basis of legal precedent or on the basis of ethics and morality. And the judges in this case also questioned who was qualified to make the decision of who should live and who should die. And they further observed that such a principle might be, in the words of one of the judges, the, quote, legal cloak for unbridled passion and atrocious crime. So although they were aware of the men's awful predicament, they were very concerned that if they allowed the defence of necessity here, that it could potentially open the floodgates to other people using the defence. What is interesting, though, is that although they were convicted of murder, Dublin Stevens was sentenced to the statutory death penalty with a recommendation for mercy. And so the usual sentence of death was actually lowered to six months imprisonment. So although they were found guilty of murder and the courts were saying we cannot recognise the defence of necessity, clearly by showing such mercy and lowering death to six months, they were really aware of this life or death predicament. So in a way, they're sort of recognising it by not giving the normal punishment out. Case highlights quite clearly then how restrictive the defence of necessity is. Because to me, if you're ever going to allow the defence of necessity, this is the perfect case for it. They were going to die if they didn't kill him and he was going to die anyway. So from a utilitarian point of view, the greatest good for the greatest number. Um, and this was life or death situation, as I've said. Um, but you can see here the court really not wanting to recognise the defence of necessity. And we've got the case of Southwark and Williams here, where Lord Denning gives a lovely quote, which illustrates, I suppose, the reluctance why the courts don't want to recognise necessity. And Denning says, quote, Necessity would open a door which no man could shut. If hunger were once allowed to be an excuse for stealing, the plea would be an excuse for all sorts of wrongdoing. The courts must take a firm stand. And he does make a valid point here because when he's talking about necessity would open a door which no man could shut, he's referring to opening the, the floodgates to litigation. That if you allow the defence of necessity in Dudley and Stevens, for instance, even though that was an extremely unusual set of facts, then if you've allowed the defence there, you're potentially going to have to allow it for other crimes and other issues as well. And this is a valid point he's making, that if um, someone is starving, say a homeless person on the street, and they steal from Tesco a sandwich, we can totally understand that. And, you know, I would want him personally to have the sandwich. But we can't have that as a defence because... In all situations, people would then be able to say, well, I was going to lose my house, I was going to do this, I was going to do that. Um, and it could be an excuse for all sorts of wrongdoing, all sorts of crimes. So the court's really reluctant to recognise the defence. said at the beginning of this video, the defence of necessity has been more successful, though, in medical cases. And we'll take a look at some of those now. So we're going to start by looking at REF the mental patient sterilisation case from 1990. In this case, Lord Goff specifically recognised the existence of the defence of necessity and applied it. Sin uh, Rief, where the F was a 36-year-old woman and she had a serious mental disability caused by an infection when she was a baby. She had been a voluntary inpatient in a mental hospital since the age of 14. She had a verbal capacity of a child of two um, and a mental capacity of a child of four, which makes it a bit strange that she then developed a sexual relationship with a fellow patient. 
Her mother and medical staff at the hospital were concerned that she wouldn't cope with pregnancy and childbirth and wouldn't be able to raise a child herself. Other methods of contraceptives were not practical for her for medical reasons, so they sought a declaration that it would be lawful for her to be sterilised. F was incapable of giving valid consent since she didn't appreciate the implications of the operation, giving her mental age. Um, but the court agreed uh, to the declaration and it was granted so that she could be sterilised without her consent. Delivering his judgment, Lord Gough said, quote, and I'm going to read this out to you because he's, he's talking about the defence. He said, it is well established that as a general rule, the performance of a medical operation upon a person without his or her consent is unlawful, as constituting both the crime of battery and the tort of trespass to the person. Furthermore, before Scott Baker J in the Court of Appeal, it was common ground between the parties that there was no power in the court to give consent on behalf of F to the proposed operation of sterilisation or to dispense with the need for such consent. So if such treatment is to be administered without consent, without that being unlawful, it has to be justified on some other principle. Upon what principle can medical treatment be justified when given without consent? We are searching for a principle upon which, in limited circumstances, recognition may be given to a need in the interests of the patient that treatment should be given to him in circumstances where he is temporarily or permanently disabled from consenting to it. It is this criterion of a need which points to the principle of necessity as providing justification. So in other words, he's saying the defence of necessity is a defence to battery on this patient because the sterilisation is necessary in her own best interests. The most liberal application of the defence of necessity was seen in the unusual case of Rie, where the defence of necessity was allowed for the offence of murder in relation to a life-saving operation to separate two conjoined twins, Mary and Jodie. The facts of this case were that Mary and Jodie were conjoined twins joined at the pelvis. Jodie was the stronger of the two and capable of living independently. However, Mary was weaker and she was described as having a primitive brain and was completely dependent on Jodie for her survival. According to medical evidence, if the twins were left as they were, Mary would eventually be too much for strain on Jodie and they would both certainly die. If they operated to separate them, this would inevitably lead to the death of Mary, but Jodie would have a strong chance of living an independent life. The parents refused consent for the operation to separate them because they were quite religious um, and they, they quoted sanctity of life. They wanted God to choose. So the doctors applied to the court for a declaration that it would be lawful and in the best interests of the children to operate without the parents' consent. The High Court granted the declaration on the grounds that the operation would be akin to withdrawal of support i.e. an omission rather than a positive act, and also the death of Mary, although inevitable, was not the primary purpose of the operation. The parents appealed to the Court of Appeal, and the appeal was dismissed. The operation could be lawfully carried out by doctors. And Brooke LJ listed the requirements for the application of necessity in these circumstances. He said that where an act was done only to avoid consequences which could not otherwise have been avoided, i.e. they both would have died, the consequences would have inflicted, inflicted sorry, inevitable and irreparable evil. Interesting language there, talking about evil. No more was done than was reasonably necessary. So obviously they weren't trying to kill Mary, they would just separate them and try their best to save Mary. And the evil inflicted was not disproportionate to the evil avoided. And again, it's coming back to that sort of utilitarian perspective. One dies, but one lives. So it's not disproportionate. The operation was carried out. And this is a picture of Jodie taken a few years after the operation to separate them. Um, and she's living a full and healthy life. 
Our last case we're looking at on necessity is Shayla, and this case simply added a further criteria for the defence of necessity to be available, that the evil must be directed towards the defendant or someone for whom they had responsibility. So it has to be a named person, not the public at large. And we'll end there with a summary of duress and necessity.